Hello and thank you very much for coming along. This evening we're going to look at some issues that have to do with survival in the ecosystem and whether we as a human species can catch on in a sense to the rules fast enough to change our behavior so that we can continue to live in the ecosystem. We didn't create the ecosystem. We don't know how to behave in it. We certainly can't control it and we're in trouble when we think we're in charge of it. We need to learn fast how to subordinate our activities within the functioning rules of the system. If we don't, we'll be dismissed, as every other species has been dismissed that didn't, as it were, understand and learn to behave within the parameters the rule governed system uh, in place. So we're going to look at this as a, uh, a problem of enduring principles in a changing ecosystem. The ecosystem is always changing. And we're going to have to adapt some revolutionary metaphors for human survival in an evolutionary world. If we want to be part of the continuing evolution of life forms on the Earth's surface, we're going to have to do some pretty revolutionary things to the way we think about our role in an ecosystem. In other words, the metaphors we live by. Because there are enduring principles in the ecosystem, even though it changes through different phases. It does that as a matter of the natural evolution of natural systems. We should perhaps begin by locating ourselves in space and in time. I don't mean just personally, but we can start there. On one level it would seem to be pretty easy, <clears throat> both easy and not problematic, to say who we are and where we are, right? In space and time. We all know who we are, and we all know where we live, right? Now this is the question. Do we really know where we live and who we are in a complex ecosystem? Especially in a changing world. In a changing world, this can be increasingly troublesome. Climate change will express itself, as we're beginning to learn, as a world water crisis. There's no question about this now. If you live in the Midwest, you certainly know that. Uh, you know it if you're living on the coast and rising sea level is beginning to register itself. You know that if you're living in drought areas. You know that if you're subject to floods, as in Mozambique, with typhoons hitting at an unprecedented rate on the east coast of Africa. And yet, we're up against this question. Where we are and who we are in a complex ecosystem is very troublesome. Where are we in reference to the emerging water crisis? Not just personally, not just as members of Massachusetts state <laughs> citizenry, or of the United States citizenry for that matter, but where is the human species on a planet that seems to be running out of water? What's the problem and what's the solution? So beyond our immediate circumstance of who we are and where we live, we should perhaps locate ourselves in a larger space <clears throat> and longer time frame. Now one of the things you do that with is to look at the evolutionary history of the species. We've been around for about a million years or so as a human species and that's capable of interbreeding and replicating itself. And for a long time that looked like a pretty gradual process of increase over time. But in relatively recent time, since roughly the Renaissance onwards, after the plague where there was a dip in human population, substantial dip in the 1340s, 1350s, there's been a resurgence of human populations around the world, which we've generally been in favor of and applaud. 
Well, the applause can be a bit loud at times, but <laughs> the fact is we thought of that as a good thing, right? Well, it's a destabilizing thing in any ecosystem to have a population <laughs> explode. And whether you applaud it or you regard it as an explosion is largely dependent upon your point of view. In an ecosystem, though, any population that explodes has implications for other populations that it's related to. It's never happened before and will never happen again, the kind of explosion that's occurred since 1945. The world's population has tripled since 1945. In the lifetime of one living person, a person born in 1945 would be 74 years old at this point, in the t lifetime of one living person, the whole population of humans on Earth has tripled from 2.5 billion to roughly 7.5 billion now. So we're locating ourselves in time in a very exceptional moment that never existed before and can never exist again. This is pretty extraordinary. When you look at the larger frame of the whole population moment, that is, you look at us from space, we find out a whole series of other things. Most remarkably, we live on the only blue planet in the known universe. There's no other water-based planet that we've been able to observe. So in the known universe, there's no other that has the temperature gradient to maintain water in its liquid state at the surface. This is an extraordinary fact, and it's worth some extended reflection. Reflection on the uniqueness now in terms of space, I mean cosmic space, as well as in terms of time in our species history. When you realize that we live on the only blue planet in the known universe, and we seem to be running out of water, we're in real trouble. There's something wrong on this water wealthy planet. We live on the only blue planet in the known universe, yet as a species we may be running out of water because of how we're treating it, reacting to it, legislating about it, behaving in reference to it, and arranging our living patterns in reference to water. We basically need to address the ethical, scientific, public health, and policy dimensions of this crisis to avoid massive human suffering in the very near future. Very, very near future. If you take a longer view of it, it's really quite extraordinary. And in, like the space people who went to uh, the moon and the cameras that take pictures of us from afar and even further than the moon, it's really quite a marvel. It's often referred to, in fact, as the blue marble, but it's also the blue marvel in a very important sense. We live on the only blue planet in the known universe. Can we learn to survive sustainably within the rhythms of the biogeochemical cycling of its water, this symbol and substance of life? All life, not just our lives as a human species. Well, in fact, whether we can depends upon how we locate ourselves in Earth's complex ecosystem, and specifically how we organize ourselves in relation to water, the symbol and substance of life. If we think we're in charge of water, uh, we're not even reading the newspapers. We're not even understanding the impact of cyclones, of droughts of Midwestern floods. We haven't even begun to take notes on the most important aspects of water, which are the hydrological cycle. 
we've got to figure out how to resort our own behavior within the parameters, the rules, the governing principles of the hydrological cycle. Although we live in a water wealthy world, alone in the universe, so far as we can tell, we've got problems with water scarcity. Problems, real problems that are leading to, in many cases, massive death and an increasingly massive death as climate changes. As the amount of water moves, for example, from oceans into the atmosphere and then dumps itself as rain, torrential rain, over the continents, we're going to see lots and lots, hundreds of millions of people affected. Our use of water is pretty extraordinary as it is. We've come to depend on agriculture as a species and 70% of the water that we use is consumed in agriculture. Only a small percent, 8%, is for domestic use and industrial use counts for about 22% of our use of water. <clears throat> Global access to water and sanitation is not at all uh, uniform and in fact the percent of people without improved water supply is pretty staggering. Um, <clears throat> most people don't have uh, improved water supplies and a large portion of the population, 40 percent apparently, um, in fact is without basic sanitation. Now the question is what are the, in a sense, trends in these? Is that sliver growing, the red zone, becoming a larger portion of the 100%? And is this question of sanitation growing as a global problem? Well, the trends aren't hopeful especially when you look at where the water is and how it is that we're fighting over the minimal supply. When you look at the blue planet, you have to remember that the vast majority of it, like 97.5% of it, according to the figures in this UN study, is in the oceans. It's not fresh water. It's not something you and I can drink. Fresh water accounts for only 2.5% of the whole operation. That's what the entire human population depends on, fresh water. And as it turns out, fresh water, non-salt water, is mainly tied up in glaciers and in ice caps. Although that's rapidly changing, that's rapidly melting and moving into the salt water. So it's becoming unobtainable and unuseful for human purposes as it moves from the glaciers and melts and goes into the oceans. Some of it melts and goes into groundwater, another 30%, and only 3.3, that is, sorry, 0.3%, much less than 1%, less than one-third of 1% of the water is in rivers and lakes that we can draw upon to live as a human community. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to realize if the proportions of that are decreasing at the same time that human population is increasing, we've got a water crisis. We understand this because although two-thirds of the world, as we've said, is covered with water, 97% of that water is salt water, and of the remaining 3% is fresh water, two-thirds of that is locked up in the polar ice sheet world population is competing increasingly and very viciously for the use of the remaining 1%. Now, this is the problem that we're facing with water scarcity. The competing uses of water can be sort of indicated in agriculture, industry, municipal authorities, energy companies, environmentalists, small farmers versus large farming, uh, sanitation issues and the like. But the big question is really, can we <coughs> proceed with our illusions about water as a resource 
or as a commodity? Is it a resource or is it a commodity? Well, the world got together back in the year 2000 and had a conference on this. Let's take a look. In a country where there's water everywhere, too much water, comes a global warning of scarcity and crisis. Symbolized here in song and dance, and bluntly expressed by ministers and water experts. These facts justify the language of crisis, heard more and more in relation to the issue of water. Disturbing facts. A billion people without access to safe drinking water. Three million deaths a year from water-related diseases. And it will get worse, says the World Bank, unless there's a fundamental shift from public to private, giving water a price tag and letting free enterprise move in where governments have failed, becoming suppliers to meet the needs of a growing population. I say, let us discuss things. What has worked and what has not worked. Ismael Sara Galvin is chairman of the World Commission on Water. There's no expectation that government resources will be able to make the jump from 70 to 80 million dollars a year to 180 million dollars a year. This has been an outrageous display of arrogance, of corporate control, of control by the World Bank. The Council of Canadians and Labour Unions tried to lead a rebellion here, a small voice against the power and influence of the World Bank. Water, they argue, is not a commodity to be bought and sold, but a vital, precious resource that needs protecting. Okay, well that becomes the debate then, right? Is it a commodity, or is it a resource for the service and use of humankind? No population can live without water. Individuals can't live for more than two weeks without water, and really two weeks is stretching it. Yet, is that a privately ownable commodity, or is it a public resource? Well, this is the kind of debate that's going to be emerging, and is emerging. While the World Bank came in on the side of privatizing water, there was a conference in Vancouver a year later that made the issue much more an open debate. We're in a transformative moment. I believe in the next five years we'll have the decisive period. It's going up against nations, multinational corporations, corporate states. We are at the very center of what is going to happen. About whether the commercial market logic of global corporations will work, or whether the earth logic of the sustenance of life, including our lives, will work. We are on the cusp of a great set of decisions around what will happen to the world's water. <laughs> Welcome to the water revolution. Welcome to Vancouver. Water for the people was the argument at the time, and in fact, around the world, there was an indication of the water crisis from different sources. Take a look. The world's water is imperiled, and the way we are moving now is going to ensure us that whole ecosystems collapse, that whole species collapse, and that many millions, perhaps billions of people will die because we have decided on a water survival of the fittest mode. We have a water crisis because of commercial activities not respecting the water cycle and the limits of water. Logging was about commerce. It has destroyed our catchments. Mining was about commerce. It has absolutely devastated our aquifers. Industrial agriculture was about commerce. It has drained our water systems dry. Commerce does not solve ecological crises, it creates them. There are, I would say, a handful of transnationals, although there's more than one in, who have the full intention of privatizing the entire world's water stock. The same companies, the same Bechtel, the same Vivendi, the same Swiss Lionnais 
are all over trying to colonize the water of the world. The same Monsantos are trying to colonize the seeds and biodiversity of the world. The same Gargils and ADMs are trying to control our food systems. They literally do not believe anything belongs in the commons, not health care, not education, not air, not seas, not genes, and certainly not water. They consider it blue gold. They're backed by international institutions like the World Bank, which is forcefully promoting privatization of water in developing countries. How did private water companies make it to Benin, Honduras, Nicaragua, Niger, Panama, Rwanda, Tanzania, and other poor nations? They've had their access delivered by the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank around the world places conditions that impose water privatization. We know that privatization, particularly privatization uh, by large multinational corporations will increase the suffering of people. International trade agreements, whether NAFTA, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trades with its WTO, the upcoming Fair Tr uh, Trade Agreement of the Americas or Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, guarantee corporations the right to water. The basic thing about international trade agreements is that they exist as a constitution which supersedes the sovereign prerogatives of governments at all levels. You have to comply with these rules or you can be punished very severely uh, by the imposition of international trade sanctions or damage awards in the case of foreign investor claims. We access your resources, your trees, your fish, your water on whatever terms we dictate without having to invest a penny in your community or add any value to those resources before we extract them. That's free trade in a nutshell. Well, you can see free trade agreements are answering the question, who does water belong to? In terms of saying, well, it belongs to those who can capture it and privatize it. Well, this is not the answer, according to many others. And in fact, the question is, who owns the water? Take a look. Who does water belong to? Who should control it? In a globalizing world, these questions drive an increasingly polarized debate. On one side are those who believe water is a public good, a human right, which cannot and should not be controlled by interests out for profit. People like Oscar Oliveira, a Bolivian labor organizer. God has given us water. It rains in the high country, it rains on the lakes, it rains on the fields. The only thing the water company should do is to help St. Peter get the water to the people so that we all are able to use it. On the other side are those who believe in the privatization of water, that the free market is the most efficient mechanism to deliver the water that people need. If you are genuinely concerned with them getting water, what is the best route to do that? It's a practical question, it's not a moral question. And a declaration that water is owned by the public, to be managed by the public for the good of everybody, we've had decades of that and it hasn't worked. Well, that's the debate. <laughs> well, in fact, have we had decades of it? Not really. We've had decades of privatization. There are alternatives, balancing water for humans and nature, and it has to do whether we can flow and stock the material correctly. And who gets to make the decisions about stock and flow? This is why there are ethical principles, not just practical principles, but ethical principles for smart growth. And we need to pay attention to these principles if we want to survive in an ecosystem. We'll be going over these in the future, but keep an eye on the steps towards an ecological Ten Commandments. Because it's only by paying attention to the way the ecosystems actually work that we'll have any chance of surviving within it. We live in the largest known source of water in the known universe, but can we act to save it? Good question. There is no planet B. We only have one Earth. we only get one chance.
Uh, good job.